I'm so glad to be here. And it's so much fun to also meet some of my Facebook friends for the first time. That's so cool. <laughs> I always like that. So um, my talk tonight is on the minorities in the Confederate military combat support. Though, make no mistake, people that look like me also carry muskets. Now, you're going to hear me tonight talk about people of color, persons of color. And the reason why I say that is because working at the Museum of the Confederacy, one of the things I found was different documents describing people that look like me. So for example, um, I may have been known as a Negress back then. I could have been known as a mulatto. If I lived in Louisiana, they, they broke down even more. And if they just couldn't figure it out, you were a person of color. So that's why you may hear me say that tonight, just to uh, give you an idea. And that's why you also have the United States color troops on the other side. So there's nothing wrong with saying people of color. I know they tell you that it is a problem, but really it isn't. Because um, if you understand Europeans and Africans mixed, you also have Africans that mixed with um, Indians, and then you had tri-racial, so you're talking African, European, and Indian. So there is no problem with that. Um, first thing I would like to ask, how many people in here have served in the military? All right, I want to thank you for your service. Here's the second question I want to ask you. Can you run your military without combat support? Mm -hmm. You can. And yet we have historians that will tell you that the men of color who served in a combat support position were men and they were not soldiers, blah, 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 blah. I'm sure you've all heard it. Mm -hmm. So that's why I call this Minorities of the Military Combat Support or hidden in plain sight. Mm -hmm. Now, how in the world did I get involved in this in the first place? It was in a Mexican restaurant over margaritas. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes alcohol and history mix, and sometimes it doesn't. But my friend said, oh, Teresa, there's no such thing as black confederates. Well, you know, there were body servants, they were musicians, um, they were teamsters, but they were never paid, they were never on any, um, muster rolls, they, 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 they don't have any service. I mean, it just, it was just really, really. So, we're going to talk about that tonight. So the first thing we're going to talk about is free blacks. And why is this important? Because when we talk about black confederates, the first thing most people will say, well, you know, they were slaves and they went in with their owner's um, son, or they went in with their master, blah, 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 blah. But they forget that there were a lot of free blacks living in the South. So here you have the U.S. federal census record from 1790 to 1860. There were always more free blacks living in the South than in the North. Now, I want you to know some blog, someone called me a Confederate liar. I said, well, I'll wear that proudly. But you know what? You, it's the federal census. I'm not making this up. So by 1860, you have over 250,000 living in the South versus 225,000 living in the North. And the reason why I'm talking about this is people forget that there were free people of color that served in the Confederate military. So you remember how my friend said, oh, there were never any service records? Well, guess what? Go to Fold Free. Here you got Carter Burwell, Company H, 32nd Virginia Infantry. He was a cook. You've got Charles Dempsey, who was a private, who was a color cook with the 2nd North Carolina Artillery. And you have P. Green, who was with Hager's 1st South Carolina Infantry in a color band. And for a long time, I didn't know who the rest of the color band was, but I found them. So they all have service weapons. So let's go back right before the war happens. South Carolina and Georgia are going to pass a resolution because they need some work done on forts. And on the right hand side is for the owners to say thank you for your patriotic duties. On the left hand side, you have the, the names of the owners, how many um, slaves were used at Fort Pulaski, because we're dealing with Georgia here, and how many days they worked at Fort Pulaski, and that they paid the slaves. What? They paid the slaves. Now I want you to know, when I found this document, I took it to several professors. And what is, <coughs> well, um, well, we just know that it went to the owners. No, they paid the slaves. And it's important to understand that because we are taught that slaves had no money. They had no agency. 
However, you could be hired out. And it's called the hired out slave system. So this is what happens. Here I am. I'm a slave out on a plantation or on a farm out in the rural area. And my owner decides that he's going to hire me out to Richmond, Virginia. Richmond, Virginia, before the war breaks out, is integrated, integrated neighborhoods. And as a slave, I got the freedom to choose where I want to live because you have free black slaves and whites all living in the same neighborhood. Now, I want you to know that some people who are not like us, and you know what I'm talking about, I don't have to mention it, told me, well, that's just awful. I said, how is it awful? A slave had the freedom to pick where he or she wanted to live. Why is that a problem? Anyway, so I go to work for Tretica Iron Works. It's time to get paid. Half is going to go to me, and half the salary will go to my owner. However, if I choose to work overtime, all that money comes to me. So what did you do? You accumulate that money. And then you go back, and you try to negotiate your freedom. Now, I think it's ironic that I show this to the press and they say, oh, I'm sure the money went to the, to, the, to the owners. Well, how many times have you heard how a slave was able to buy that freedom? Well, this is how it was done. Okay? So now we're in the war period. On the left-hand side is Billy Wheeler. He was a free man of color. He did fortification work for Manassas under General Johnston. That's his receipt for pay. And on the right-hand side is actually a three-page document. You had a committee of free women of color. And then you had women who were working in the hospitals and others who were waiting. When I talk about the Confederate effort, I mean all of it, not just on the battlefield. We're talking railroads, hospitals, working in the mines. Everything was needed for the Confederate effort. And here you have Teamsters transferred to Manassas Junction. Now, Teamsters and Modern Farming is your transportation corps. So these are the people who are involved in getting their supplies to you. And on this particular page, you have free blacks, whites, and slaves all working together as Teamsters. And here we have R.L. Christian, who was a quartermaster for 1st Virginia Artillery. Now, look, I got to tell you, I love me some quartermasters. Why? Because you can read their handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I kid you not, I have not come across any quartermaster records that I can't read. And they are your bean counters. They have to take care of everything. And so R.L. Christian actually kept great records from 1862 to 1865. So on here, you've got, you got blacksmiths and teamsters. It tells you who's free, who's actually a slave, and how much they're paid. Now, in July of 1863, he's going to take his team to Gettysburg. How many people have seen the movie Gettysburg? Gettysburg, the movie Gettysburg. Oh. Well, they got to redo that movie. Because <laughs> my people are missing. Thousands, thousands of men of color went to lead to Gettysburg, okay? So he takes his teamsters to Gettysburg, and you look at the payroll, and then he says, all his teamsters are gone. The enemy has them, so he can't pay them. So I tell people, if you're wearing a gray uniform and you are color and you were captured on the battlefield, you're going to prison, just like everybody else. And if you went to prison in Gettysburg, most likely you went to Fort Delaware and then to Point Lookout. And then we have Joseph Parkman. As you know, I used to work at the Museum of the Confederacy. And they have the Appomattox Parole Duplicate List. So I got a little curious and saw a name on there, Joseph Parkman, with the 18th Battalion Georgia Infantry. It said he was a musician. So I said, well, let me check on 403 to see if we had a service record. Well, bang, there it is, service record. But here's what was on there. He received a $50 bounty to enlist. $50. It's incredible. But what's even more incredible, his name's at the top of the Appomattox Parole duplicate list. 52 years old. He survived from 1862 to 65. And he's a 52-year-old black man. Now, why am I telling you he's black? Because they actually tell you black, brown, light, yellow. And why is this important? Because I had a historian, and actually several people have told me, well, if they're wearing gray uniform, they're passing for white. Um, 
I don't think so. I don't think so. And they tell you what, if they're a musician, they're safe. Well, a musician's in a dangerous position. They're the ones that are calling out how the regiment is going to move on the battlefield. And may I say, bullets and cannon fire do not discriminate. Do you seriously think a bullet's going, excuse me, you, the musician, you need to move over to the left because I'm trying to get that white man. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. But yet we have historians that would tell you these kind of things. And people believe it. And then we have Ferdinand Figgett, Company E, 55th Virginia Infantry. He's a private. He's a musician. They first hired him to be a fifer. And then he actually enlisted again with a $50 bounty. Now, according to the regimental series, he was young and handsome and he liked women. <laughs> However, he is not going to make it through the war. He is going to succumb to disease. Keep going. But then I found women who had service records. So here you have Catherine Dawson, who's a cook with the Georgia Infantry, 63rd. You also have Hannah Dawson, who's a cook. And you also have Julia Bellman, who's a free woman of color. She's a laundress with a hospital service records, so you will find women with service records on all three. And here we have the Bonatok Artillery Anderson Battery. I found this actually in the archives in the library of the UDC Memorial Building, and I was thrilled to pieces because right there in the corner are two black men. I was like, oh, this is so cool. And also the Bonatok Artillery is the only Virginia regiment that's going to go to Vicksburg. Okay. So I'm all thrilled. I said, oh my gosh, they got names and everything. I said, let me see if I can find out something about them in the regimental series on the box top artillery. So if you've ever used those regimental series, you know there's a roster in the back. So I'm looking for them, looking for them, I can't find them. And then something told me to look at the last page. And there they are. Negro Servants with Company. Albert Anderson, William Mayer. Albert Anderson, no further information. William Mayo, they say he's married with two children in the 1860 census. So what does that tell you if he's in the 1860 census? He's a free man. Now, what bothered me about this is why didn't they just put their names in alphabetical order with the rest? But oh, they're the Negro servants. And it was decided that they were Negro servants. However, I have met some of the descendants of Albert Anderson, and he saw that. He lived into the 1920s. So he passed on his information to people. So let's talk about the salaries. Teamsters, $20 a month. Laundresses, $10 to $11 per month. That's your base pay, and then you pay by the piece. Assistant cooks, $15 a month. Chief cook, $20. Restaurant fortification, fifteen, and a private was making anywhere from eleven to thirteen dollars a month. So the Confederate military understood the skills of these men and women and paid them accordingly. Oh, and by the way, the system cooks, chief cook, that was actually documented. That was actually part of Congress making that decision. And it will tell you, it didn't matter whether you were black or white, that was your salary. Impressment laws. Well, let me tell you about that. Because how many of y'all have been told, well, if they were black, they were forced? Raise your hands. How many have been told that? Go ahead, put them up. <laughs> I know, I know y'all heard it. I know you've heard it. Yes, there were men and women who were impressed in the service, which means you went for a certain period of time. However, however, the Conscription Act is going to be passed on both sides of the war because the war takes longer than anyone thought and they needed more men. If you are conscripted, that means you're drafted. If you're drafted, that means you are forced to go. So usually when people say, well, you know, Teresa, they were forced. I say, in the conscription act did what? And it's like, you're forced to go. So usually they say, well, it was nice talking to you and then they turn around and leave because what else is there to talk about? Remember, men of color, some were impressed, some enlisted, and some were conscripted. That's the way it was. And here you have a circle for Dr. Tanner, Chief Surgeon, 21st North Carolina Infantry, 
Hope's Division. In it, it says, there's so many Negroes that are being injured or sick. We need hospital tents for them. Three as a minimum. And then, here we go. I found this document. This was a bill to repeal the enlistment of Colts of 1862, because as I said, they were enlisted in 1862. Well, what happens? The army marches on its stomach. You're not giving me the cook. It's not going anywhere. And the way it's written is there was more concern about the slaves as opposed to the free people. And I think it could have been because you know, you promise the owners you will have them for a certain amount of time and then they don't come back. And But it's going to go down in defeat because you need your cooks. You can't let your cooks go. And so that's why Carter Burwell in 1864 is still the chief cook for his unit. So let's talk about some of these men. Charles Dempsey, private color cook, 2nd North Carolina Artillery. He's going to be captured at Fort Fisher, North Carolina. He goes to prison. He's going to Point Lookout. And then you have Henry Dempsey, who's in the same unit. He's going to be captured at Fort Fisher. He's going to go to Point Lookout. But guess what? They were exchanged. What? They were exchanged. That means that they exchanged them for a union equivalent. Now, if the federal government can recognize that these men were in the military and exchange them, then why are we having a problem with this in the 21st century? Mm -hmm. And furthermore, knowing how history is much more complex and that we've been told that there's only one cause to the war, why would you send anyone of color back to the South? See, it all doesn't make sense. It all doesn't make sense. And I want you to know that these two particular men were exchanged and came back. However, some of the other men of color who were captured at Fort Fisher will not be released until June of 1865. And then my friend, Greg Eames, who's written a book on Virginia Black Confederates, called me one day and said, Teresa, you're not gonna believe what I found. He said, what, Greg, what did you find? He says, here is a Confederate military discharge for a white soldier, Charles Gilliam, 18th Virginia Infantry. But I also found G.W. Smith, who was a slave of the 32nd Virginia Infantry, and George Price, who was a free man in the 18th Virginia Infantry. Those are their Confederate military discharge papers. Okay, so what does that tell you? They were all in the military. They were all in the Army. And they all received the same discharge papers. And what we know today, in, in that modern army is DD-214. So, here's the paperwork. Here is the paperwork. And here we have Richard Popper. I don't know how many of you have been to Blanford Cemetery in Petersburg or know about Dick Poplar Day. Dick Poplar Day happens every September in conjunction with the POW MIA honoring them. And so, he's buried there He's with the Company H, 13th Virginia Cavalry. Once again, guess where he was? Gettysburg. I'm telling you, the movie has to be redone. <laughs> he was in Gettysburg. He is captured in Gettysburg. He goes to Fort Delaware for four months. And then he's going to be transferred to Point Lookout for about 14, 15 months. Why is that Point Lookout? They kept saying, just sign the oath of allegiance, and then we're just going to let you go. He wouldn't do it. He refused. And they would come back over and over again. Just sign the oath of allegiance. And he says, well, I just want to stay with my men. Okay, so then they said, just sign the oath. Finally, he said, I'm a Jeff Davis man. Now, eventually, he will be exchanged. And people will forget about him. Until about 30 years ago, when somebody found his obituary where the men from the 13th Virginia Cavalry were his pallbearers, including one ex-Confederate general, which is incredible. And in one of the articles, it mentioned in his obituary that he had cooked for the men in Gettysburg. 
Okay, so let's fast forward to September 2017. Richmond, Virginia at that time was all in a tizzle because there was this group that came up who decided to have a rally around the Robert Lee Monument and we had to have all this police and every reporter from all over the world were there to cover it because they were waiting for you know, something horrible to happen. Well, one Japanese um, news outfit decided to go down to Blanford Cemetery for Dick Poplar Day and also a reporter from the Taiwan area also came. So somewhere in Tokyo, I'm in Japanese. Because <laughs> they interviewed me. All right. So the other reporter said, I want to interview you. Here's my card. I'll give you a call, blah, 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 blah. So eventually she called me to write about Dick Poplar Day. She had a service record. It says he went in as a private, left as a private. She could not wrap her head around that at all. At all. She said, well, they said he cooked. I said, he made his living as a cook. Of course he cooked for the men. Well, I said, so you have a service record. Then she went down the path. Well, Lincoln, I said, oh, here we go. <laughs> I said, do you seriously think he called up 75,000 to free slaves? Really? I said, have you read the Emancipation Proclamation? It's a war measure. It freed no one. It's the 13th Amendment. But Lincoln, Lincoln what? I said, you have a service record. It shows that he was a private and he left as a private. I said, he was captured on the battlefield of Gettysburg. He was a POW. She couldn't, she, I was drinking a glass of wine at the time. And I'm so glad I had it because I was swirling around going, oh my gosh, I can't take this. You know, and I couldn't get through to her. She wrote a very degrading article about this man because she could not here you've got something from the National Archives that's telling you he's a private and she could she could she couldn't she just could not handle him. So here she wrote this article and anyone who read that article believed what she had to say. And this is what we're fighting today. A lot of people say Teresa, oh you need to talk to the press. What for? I tried. I tried multiple times. And either they they misrepresentate, you know, there's a misrepresentation of what I said, or if I'm on television, it's a two second bite. It doesn't make any sense. So I, I just don't like to do it anymore. And this was a perfect case of this. And it was so upsetting because you had these people who come every September to honor him, and she wrote this disgraceful report. And here we have Barry Black, Company D, 15, Tennessee. He's a private. Now, interesting enough, Tennessee had a special law when the war breaks out that the governor had the ability to enlist free men of color from the age 15 through the age 50. And that makes so much more sense when you look at this book, which is the Tennessee Colored um, Confederate Pension Application. So Barry Black, Company D, 15th Tennessee Cavalry, is one of John Hunt Morgan's men. Okay, so he's going to be captured, and he's going to end up at Camp Chase. And then he is transferred to Camp Douglas, and he will die there. And here we have James Gottman. He's a teamster. See, Gettysburg, y'all. See, you see what I'm telling you? Got to do the movie open. Got to do it open. <laughs> Teamster, he was injured. They amputated his leg. He died. He was buried. The Hollywood Ladies Memorial Association decided that all the men on the Confederate side who were buried at Gettysburg would need to come back south. All right, so they're going to hire Dr. Weaver. They're going to disinter, he's going to disinter all these men. And so he comes back. And he's buried at Gettysburg, we don't know where. I mean, buried at Hollywood, we don't know where. However, what's important, it makes it a integrated cemetery. Why is that important? Because on the National Cemetery, the USAT and the white soldiers are, are buried separately. But also James Dobbin is not the only one. Presley Hines died of laryngitis, which 
I don't think that's what he really died of. I think it was some kind of throat ailment. They didn't know what else to call it. He died at Shimborazo Hospital, and he's buried at Oakwood Cemetery, making that an integrated cemetery. And now we come to my ancestor, George Washington. And guess the name of his wife? Martha. Martha. <laughs> so I have a George and Martha Washington in my line, but it's not the one you're thinking. <laughs> this is my great-great-grandfather. Okay, He was a free man of color from King and Queen County. Did fortification work at Gloucester Point, which was a fort created during the American Civil, uh, American Civil War. American Revolution. And it was to protect everyone from the Union gunboats coming down the York River. And I remember when I found out about this, I told a friend of mine who worked in a particular archives. And I said, oh, I found my ancestor. He was involved during the war. And he said, oh, that's great, because he thought he was USCT. I said, no, he was on the Confederate side. Oh, he was forced. In two seconds, my ancestor went from being a good person to a bad person. And I was too stunned, but if I talk to him now, I'm good to go. You know. And also, uh, working at the UEC, I had a woman call me about a year ago. She says, I think I have a black confederate in my, um, in, my, uh, in my genealogy. I said, well, what was his name? She told me his name. I said, you're not going to believe this, but I think he's on the payrolls with my great-great-grandfather. And, and so I said, let me send you that page. Lo and behold, I was right, and she's now a UDC member down in Florida. And then I found another George Washington. He's a porter. I don't know what that meant back during the Confederacy, but he's making $30 a month. And then it says here Congress gives him a raise to 40. Have not a clue, would love to know, because my gosh, he is making some serious money. Now think about that. A private's making 11 to 13, and he's going to eventually make $40 a month. I would love to know. And then here's this petition. It's at the museum. It's a petition from the Nelson Battalion of South Carolina. In it, it says, they have some mulattoes who's in the battalion, and we would like to have them removed because we think it's keeping white men from joining our battalion. They said, OK, yeah, yeah, OK, we'll do that. We'll make them teamsters. Two historians saw this document, put it in their book, and said, this is the proof to show that the Confederacy didn't want anyone black in the military, they should have done their homework. Eric and I decided to go on Fall 3 to find out what happened to them. They never left the battalion. One is going to die at Point Lookout, and another one's going to die near the trenches of Petersburg. And here we have Moses Dallas. This is important. We always talk about the Army, but also men of color served in the Navy and the Marines. And Moses Dallas was a Confederate Navy pilot. He was making $80 a month and then he will receive a raise to 100, 100. And you know what's really great about this? It's in the official records of the War Rebellion Navy, which was published by the federal government. So there's no way to dispute this. So please help me to understand. How is it that Moses G. West can be a cook in the United States color troop and be in the army? But if you're Charles Dempson and you're a cook, the CSA, you're not. How is it that George Street can be a musician in the USCT and be in the Army? But if you're Joseph Parkman, you're a musician, you're not. It makes no sense. Not at all. And one more thing. Leslie Illustrated. It was a Northern newspaper, January 1863. It says here, Negro rebel pickets as seen through the field glass. Who was looking through that field glass? It was a Union officer. Okay, and what was the story about? The fact that Lincoln's getting ready to create the United States color troops and there were some people in the North that didn't want that to happen. And yet, the whole story was the fact that a Union officer looked through his field glass and saw this and he says, they're already doing this on the Confederate side. Why not? They hoped that Lincoln was not going to be dissuaded. Now, I want you to know, one historian told me, Teresa, pay no attention to this because the Union officer did not know what he was looking at through his field glass. <laughs> now, I would like to think that the Union officer understood picket duty 
and understood what he saw through the field glass. And then here's a few more images. This one is of Mrs. Maddie Clyburn Rice. In December 2012, down in Monroe, North Carolina, they unveiled a marker for 10 Confederate pensioners of color. She was the guest and she got to unveil it because her father's name was on that marker. It took her 50 years to prove that her father wore the gray. And the only way she was able to prove it, she finally found his Confederate pension. And it changed everything. You wanted to show it. And she became a member of the UDC. She was known as a real dog. And I got to know her. And she said, you know, when my father um, was alive, he was in his 70s when I was born. And he was too old to work. I was too young to go to school, so we would go into town and hang out with the other Confederate veterans, and they would talk about the war days. And even though I was playing, I was actually listening to what they were saying. But she couldn't get anybody to believe her until she found the pension records. So, 2014, she passes away, and we decided to give her a big send-off. She um, is buried at the foot of her father's grave because that was her request. And people came from Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina to honor this woman. And in fact, all her children were there, her grandchildren and great-grandchildren. She had a 21-gun salute. It was cannon fire. Everybody had to talk. We were there for like three hours. But it was okay because everybody wanted to say something. She was so well-loved and respected. And she has a really interesting tombstone. So the UDC is represented on there, the SCB, the Military Order of Stars and Bars, and the Order of Confederate Brothers. This woman was so well respected that all the Southern heritage organizations wanted to honor her. And yet, there was a person who blogged about her and her father for five days after this and was totally disrespectful. Not only to her memory, her father's memory, and to her living children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. So, did they go to reunions? Uh, yes, people that look like me went to Confederate reunions. And this is important because these men wanted to go to these reunions. If they couldn't afford to go, then white people actually paid um, to have, make sure they could travel. All this is happening during the era of Jim Crow. And they were welcome there. And you cannot change companionship and what people went through through the war period. If you serve in the military, you cannot break that bond. So these men wanted to be at these Confederate reunions. And here's another one. So I just added this one this week, and that's of Lewis Johnson. And why did I do that? Is because back in December, we had a discussion at a city council meeting about whether or not to remove the monuments on Monument Avenue. And two black people got up and said, the reason why these monuments need to come down is because in 1902, the General Assembly changed the voting rights laws to disenfranchise, in other words, keep black men from voting. It is true that that was the intention. However, there was a clause. And in that clause, if you could prove that you served, whether it was on the Union side or the Confederate side, you still had the right to vote. Hence, Lewis Johnson here says, Negro ex-Confederate soldier. Because of that clause, he is signed up to vote in Westmoreland County, Virginia. So this is important information for people to understand. So I decided that I would get the word out so that people would know that. So another statement can be said, and the Confederate military was integrated and the United States military was segregated. Um, Eric and I were on a symposium panel, and we had some USCT uh, reenactors in there, and they liked what we had to say, but they said, you know, we get out there with our, our brothers in gray, and they keep telling us that there were thousands of them, but we can't see them. And Eric said, well, you can't see them because the Confederate military was integrated. You know exactly how many USCT you had because the military was segregated. So what's next on the agenda? I actually have a part two to this talk 
because it's time that people actually learn who these men are, see their faces, and hear their history. So I actually have a minorities in, in the Confederate military part two. And the thing that's really amazing is because we have the technology of the day, things that have been swept under the rug for decades are now coming out. More photographs are coming out, more articles in newspapers, in journals, diaries, letters. It's all coming out. It's all coming out. So some of your resources, you can go to Fold 3 with the National Archives. I want to tell you, five years ago, it was much easier to find them. They've made it more difficult. It used to be all you had to put in there was Negro, free, slave, black, color, all that. They would all just come up. They don't do that anymore. So you have to work really hard on that. You have quartermaster records, you have payrolls, state-based Confederate pensions, reunion photographs and remembrances. Um, Eric's thesis is at the North Carolina Central University Shepherd Library. There's a website called www.blackconfederatesoldiers.com and there's also books about it. And also there's um, several Facebook um, groups that talk about this history also. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention. If there's any questions, please, please feel free to ask me.